Welcome to the Pod of Inquiry, pushing the envelope for human understanding and optimization, the podcast for podiatrists. The Pod of Inquiry is designed to empower you with knowledge. What happens from there is up to you. Your host, Dr. Stephen Barrett, has designed this show to take you down some very deep rabbit holes, hopefully bringing you back out again, relatively unscathed, but cerebrally whipped, enabling a better understanding of all things worthy of inquiry. If you have more questions after the show, then that is good. The new discovery today many times was the new discovery 50 years ago, only to be suppressed or plainly ignored. Medicine and surgery can sometimes take a long while to get their paradigm shifted. We hope to have a lot of fun on this show and maybe destroy some ridiculous dogma along the journey. Thanks for joining the show today. Let's start spelunking. I'm really excited and honored to bring you my guest today, Dr. A. Lee Dellen. Dr. Dellen is a retired professor of plastic and neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins uh, University. He has been instrumental in my career and many other people's careers in the development of peripheral nerve surgery within their practices. And in fact, it's uh, become a subspecialty today. Dr. Dellen has published so many articles. I want to say more than 400 to 500 but I'm sure that by the time I give you a figure, there's going to be another 20 or 30 that will be published. He's also published many textbooks and recently published a novel called The Prosector. And we're going to talk about that in addition to many other things in this episode. And I think you'll find it very interesting to get his perspective on the history and development of peripheral nerve surgery. Without any further introduction, I want to share with you the insight from my mentor, colleague, and more importantly, very good friend, Dr. A. Lee Dellen. Good morning. I'm here with Dr. Lee Dellen, and uh, we're going to talk about peripheral nerve and his new novel, The Pro Sector. And uh, just want to thank you, uh, Lee, for coming out today and in your busy schedule. And uh, let's chat about some nerve and, and your novel. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, so uh, I finished your novel a couple of weeks ago, maybe a little longer than that. I I loved it because of all of the, um, you know, the historical information that was given uh, about, uh, just for example, like Esmark and where these things we use on a day-to-day basis actually come from. I thought the history was very good. And then I also really liked it because you had the majority of it taking place in Salt Lake City. Uh, which is where I did my undergraduate. So I had kind of a feel for that. So uh, I I enjoyed it a lot. I had a lot of fun, but I think it was uh, a great effort uh, that you did. And obviously from reading it, you you took a long time to do this. Yes. Yes. There was, there was another doctor, Michael Crichton, who graduated from Harvard medical school, but never practiced medicine. And I think many people know his work, for example, Jurassic park, coma, Um, And so a little bit in this later stage of my life, I felt like I was the new version of Michael Crichton writing about medicine, but I'm turning it into a story that might be fun for people to read. I thought it was it was a a lot of fun. And I thought the way that you uh, obviously uh, were able to weave a lot of the work that you've done over the last four or five decades um, into it. So I I think I had an additional benefit knowing you know because I've, I've followed your work for for so long and and all of the things that you and i've done and then to see that in the novel i thought it was really a, a really cool way to integrate a lot of things into a story um and like you say i think that uh people who are not really um up on necessarily a lot of the the esoteric nerve stuff will find it very enjoyable well, if my memory serves me right, you introduced um, endoscopic plantar fasciotomies as a new idea and must have met some resistance. But ultimately, I think you trained about 4,000 people to do that surgery. Is, is that correct? Yeah, that's pretty close. I think it's a little above 5,000 to 6,000. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I still have the scars in, in, the, in the back. 
from all of the arrows that were initially shot. <laughs> but uh, it's still, believe it or not, it's still a very uh, formidable procedure today. And and um, it's been incorporated in all of the, the landmark seminal orthopedic texts. And so it's... So uh, the reason I said that is that you're well aware of introducing surgical procedures that other people um, think might be ridiculous uh, to do or not have any belief that it would would work. And and what what's happened with me, really going back maybe 40 years when I first began to work on diabetics, um, things that seemed obviously true to me seemed untrue to other people. And, and I and just I'll move aside from the diabetic for a minute. Um, I began to work on joint pain. And uh, if you take any anatomy book, there's not a single nerve to any joint in the human body in an anatomy book, except to the little um, parts of your spine where doctors do know how to find a small nerve on an x-ray. And so when I would operate to denervate a knee or wrist, people would say, how can you possibly do that? There are no nerves there. And I, I just began to wonder more and more why does something seem true to a surgeon when it seems untrue to so many other, other people? And later on in my life, I decided I would try to write something about what truth was to a surgeon. And to a surgeon, it's the human body and what the anatomy is really there. And the way we learn about the human body is by doing dissections. And you worked with us on, I think, like 28 out of our 30 lower extremity nerve workshops. So you know that we we identify things, and even today we find nerves that are not where they're supposed to be. Right. And we wonder why people still have pain once we've done something. We have to go back, as a word of the drawing board, to the the human body. And when we do it, when we try to train other doctors and do an anatomy dissection to make it really perfect, that's what a prosection is and so i decided to call this new book uh, the pro sector because the book has a lot to do with identifying problems that cause pain for people by looking to see where the nerves are, really are in the human body yeah and i think that that that's a beautiful point that you bring up is that we're all pretty much much products of what we know so if something comes in that we just haven't had any exposure or it's different or contrary to the paradigm that we maybe have held for a long period of time. It's very hard for people to accept that. And I think that's been really prevalent in, in peripheral nerve. Uh, I know some of my neurology colleagues I've actually had come in and do intraoperative nerve monitoring. And the comment was made, wow, I didn't know that that common fibular nerve or common perineal nerve was so big. I, I've never seen a nerve. You know, and this is a neurologist telling you that they've never seen a nerve. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's part of it. Um, I think that, you know, you say that there's still a lot of discoveries as far as aberrant or, um, you know, less than uh, ideal um, anatomy book um, distribution of nerves, different, different anatomical variations are still being appreciated. Uh, one of the things I remember that I thought was really very good that you taught me when we were talking about sinus tarsi pain was that it's probably due to a bunch of little nerves that got damaged in that space. And so we ended up denervating and you, you and I, and uh, I forget who else was on that paper, but we published that paper way back where we we're denervating for uh, sinus tarsi pain, but that was just another way of looking at it. So your frame of reference allowed a little bit of a different perspective than somebody who was just orthopedic going, well, it's got to be just arthritis. So we'll just fuse the joint. So I thought that was kind of a, kind of goes into what you're saying here. Yeah. And one of the things that's been fun for me about working uh, with you and my training in plastic surgery and hand surgery, the only sinuses I knew about were frontal sinuses, <laughs> Your maxillary sinuses when you have colds and headaches. And when I learned there was a sinus in the foot, it was a, a very um, amazing concept to me because there shouldn't have been what we call sinuses in the foot. But you showed me on an x-ray when you hold it up, there's this space that looks just sort of like this, but surrounded by other bones. And so for me, the pain in that area could come 
once somebody sprained their ankle and torn the ligaments that hold that bony space together, you damage the small nerves, um, and that would be the source of pain. So instead of eliminating the joint, which might still leave pain if the nerve endings are there, uh, we can disconnect the nerves. Yep. Very. Yeah. But it just, if you didn't have that frame of reference to, to look at it from a little bit different perspective, I think that's one of the, the powers of multidisciplinary um, collegiality is that we, you know, can sit at a table and people look at things a little bit differently. And it's like, wow, I never really thought of that. And I think that's a, a perfect illustration of, of this. So now, have you had to practice that over and over again, saying multidisciplinary collegiality? No, yeah. but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, <laughs> if, if we were doing this later in the afternoon and we were having wine while we recorded, I might have to be a little bit careful with it. But, uh, <laughs> but I think that goes to, you know, I wanted to go back to one of your, what I think is maybe the most critical observation that happened, it's certainly in my world. And that's when you started seeing patients uh, that had carpal tunnel that also were uh, diabetic and had peripheral neuropathy. And they came back and they said, yeah, my carpal tunnel pain is is better, but I've got sensation back in this finger and this finger and half of this finger. So let's talk about that observation, because I think that was really the genesis of everything and, and why, frankly, we're sitting here having this conversation this morning. Yeah. OK. And um, what I want to say as we get into that, a little bit about um, this book, you can see on the surf on the cover, there's a hand and that's actually my right wrist. And this is my left hand operating on my right hand, and I'm actually right-handed. So this was staged in my last day in the operating room because I knew I would need a picture like that for the book cover. And when you write a book, you need a mechanism, and our book was going to be about a pain. And so uh, the person that this is supposed to be, who's a character in the book, right. gets a burn. on the, He's left-handed, and he burns the back of his right hand. A hand that's the opposite side from the carpal tunnel you were talking about but um, this man has a, a little has a young niece and she knows growing up that she can never hold her uncle's um right hand only the left hand and that motivates her to learn more about anatomy and to become a physician to help people in in pain and when we talked about those nerves and different anatomy uh the book has a part where it begins with a patient with pain in their groin after a hernia repair by a general surgeon. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know that um, that pain could be from a nerve. And only one nerve was known back, back then to be in that area. And the patient has a problem and I don't want to do a spoiler alert, but because of what happened to that patient and their persistent pain, um, a lawsuit will develop later. And the doctor who's the, woman protagonist or the hero, the heroine of the story, her name is Olivia. Um, she goes back to the anatomy lab and realizes there's a second nerve that can be involved in the pain and develops an operation, which we do uh, today, where both of these nerves are removed. And that motivation for that story, and I'm allowed to say this, was a patient of mine who was operated on in uh, California for hernia. And um, he had sufficient pain that he went and bought a gun and threatened to commit suicide. He labeled all the books in his library so his son would know what books to read because he wouldn't be around to guide his son. And then, then he called me. And ultimately, I wound up operating on him. And uh, he's remained a friend um, to this day. He's a writer and director in Hollywood. He wrote the movie uh, Tron. And there'll be a Tron ride opening in Disneyland um, next month. Actually, wow. in two months in April, and his relief of pain after that surgery that I did prompted him to say, well, you should be an institute. There should be a Dellen Institute so, so you can train and teach people about these uh, nerves. And that's really how you and I began uh, to work when I developed operations to help diabetics. Right. So... Let's go back to when you were in the clinic and you saw that first diabetic patient that had carpal tunnel and they developed 
you know, a restoration of sensation where they they did not have that. I mean, you pretty much expected that they were going to get better from the carpal tunnel surgery that you did. That was a given. But w- what was your thought process when you first saw that? Because it was contrary to everything that was being taught, actually still being taught today. Yes, you're. I'm correct about that. Well, <clears throat> after plastic surgery, as I mentioned, I trained in hand surgery. It was very common for diabetics to be sent to a hand surgeon because they had trigger fingers where the finger would lock and we would release the trigger finger. And 2% of non-diabetics get carpal tunnel syndrome, but 15% of diabetics get carpal tunnel syndrome. And if the diabetic has numbness in their feet, which is called diabetic neuropathy, one third of them have carpal tunnel syndrome. So I would see many patients who had carpal tunnel syndrome who had diabetes and their feet were numb. And I'd fix one hand. They say, well, can you do my other hand? I say, yes, we fix their other hand. (laughs) Well, these fingers feel good, but my little finger's still numb. And we knew there was another nerve at the elbow that controlled those nerves. We fixed those. And one day, one of the patients said, well, both my hands are really good. Can you do that for my feet? And so as a reflex, really, uh, I spouted out what everybody's taught in medical school. Neuropathy is part of a disease. You have to watch your blood sugar, get special shoes, see a foot and ankle doctor, let them check you out. Uh, But then one day I said, because my training um, in medical school at Johns Hopkins was find clinical problems, take them into the laboratory, come up with a solution for them. I wondered, well, why couldn't they have a nerve compression in their feet? And the more I thought about what was then called tarsal tunnel syndrome, (coughs) the more I realized it had the same symptoms as uh, a diabetic whose the bottom of their foot hurt them. And we knew in the leg there could be a nerve near the knee, just like there's a nerve near the elbow that controls the top of the foot. So if we could take a median nerve and an ulnar nerve and get a a glove distribution, including the radial nerve. Why couldn't we take the perineal nerve and the tibial nerve and get a glove distribution, a stocking distribution? And then it was up to me to figure out what was the correct operation to do at the ankle, because prior to me, people thought there was just one tunnel. And going back to the cadaver and doing careful dissections, which is a prosection, which is the name of my book, another advertisement, we realized there are actually four tunnels that need to be released and one of the dividers between the tunnel that needs to be released. And I tried that in a non-diabetic and the patient got better. And then I decided to try it in a diabetic. And if they had a tenel sign here, I would do that at the ankle. And if they had that, I would operate on them beginning in 1982. That study went till 1989 but didn't get published till 1992. I sent it to many medical journals and they would write back and say, well, they didn't say it exactly like this, but they said, you're a plastic surgeon. You're supposed to be doing facelifts. You don't have much credibility as a researcher. How do you know your patient's a diabetic? And finally, after three years of trying to get into the medical journal, we published it in the plastic surgery journal, came out in 1992. Since then, we've been working on educational approaches to train other doctors to do this work and help patients. Now, while you were at Hopkins, I remember you telling me about the rat study that you had had done um, where you actually took the rats and and you did some tarsal tunnel releases on half of your rats, I believe, after you made them uh, diabetic with streptozotism. You want to, were you kind of obliged to do some bench science uh, after making these observations? in in the clinic or how how was that historically well historically i sort of did it backwards first you have to make you have to identify a clinical problem and then take it to the laboratory and i identified the clinical problem but i began by first operating on patients and once it actually worked i began to um and trying to explain how the surgery worked and why it worked to come up with the actual biochemical mechanisms related to disease and had to design a basic science uh, study. And as you said, you can take a little animal like a rat, and if you give them this drug, streptozotism, it kills the beta islet cells in the pancreas. And in three weeks, their blood sugar becomes 400, and they're diabetic. 
and they um, don't gain weight. They lose hair. They get cataracts. And about 20% of them die if, they don't, if they're not given insulin. Well, they're, they mimic the uh, human disease. And under the microscope, I could open up these tunnels in the small little foot that a rat has, the same way I would operate in a human. And so we took, just as you said, a group of rats that were made diabetic, and they were left alone. We took another group of rats that were made diabetic and operated so they didn't have any tight area compressing the nerve. And, and the hypothesis was that, as everybody knows from how easily sugar dissolves in coffee, sugar goes into the nerve, pulls water into the nerve, and the diabetic nerve is swollen. So our hypothesis for the study was that if we could eliminate any areas of tightness around the nerve to the foot by releasing the tarsal tunnels, then even though the blood sugar is 400 and the nerve would swell, there wouldn't be a tight place for the nerve to be compressed. And so we took those two groups of nerves, one that had intact tight places, meaning that our tarsal tunnel was okay, one group that had surgery, so they did not have a tight place around their nerve. And we followed those animals for a year, which is about half the lifetime of a rat. And the way we could tell if they had neuropathy or not is the rat footprint looks sort of like the bottom of my fingers, where this is the tip of the toe, and this is their heel. And if you dip the rat's hind limb into red watercolor paint and put them on a piece of white paper, they run across the paper to get into a box and out of the light and hide. So they make footprints, and you can measure the footprints with a computer, and we could show that the diabetic rat had very long print length develop as it developed neuropathy. And the animals that we operated on who did not have a tight place walked like normal rats for one year with blood sugars of 400, which is which suggested really that every diabetic should have their tarsal tunnels um, released. But we just interpreted it to mean that if there was not, nothing compressing the swollen diabetic nerve, the problem would not um, develop. So I, I guess there's a couple of questions on that um, study. I, one of how many lab coats did you ruin from dipping the little feet into the, to the dye? <laughs> because today there are really very fancy ways of doing things. But back then, which that was pretty fancy, but in the early 80s, from a technology standpoint, nothing compared to today. And then I know you, you should comment on th that that study has been followed up by uh, Yerksel's group in Tur Turkey, as well as uh, Maria Simenow's group in, at the Cleveland Clinic. So th that study has been replicated by others than you. Yeah, yeah. so um, in science, as I think all of your listeners will know, the way you know something is true is if other people can duplicate, come up with the same answer, doing the same method or research that you did. And after the work that um, we did that I just described, a plastic surgeon in the country, uh, Turkey, uh, did the same thing. In addition to which, they opened the outer layer of the nerve to try to release pressure within the nerve. And they showed that, again, that in the absence of tunnels, the rats walk better, and that if the outer layer of the nerve was opened, they got a further improvement. Then that was a combined um, evaluation that with the animals actually uh, walking. The laboratory you mentioned at the Cleveland Clinic, which was run by a lady named Maria Simenow, who was, by the way, the first uh, one, first person to do a complete face transplant in America mm -hmm. and the world. Um, she evaluated motor function by testing the motor functions in the feet, again, utilizing the same model we used and showed motor function was improved. And then the work was done in uh, Romania. And in Romania, where it's a relatively impoverished uh, country, and they were able to study uh, pain. They would, um, if you take the rat's foot and touch it to the warm surface of a here, like the way you would keep your coffee cup warm, uh, they can measure how fast the animal pulls its feet away from, um, from the heat. And they again showed that the diabetic animals that had no tunnel, uh, acted like normals and not like a diabetic. And then finally, a, another laboratory recently in China, in Shanghai, Dr. Wen Chung Zhang's lab has evaluated pain use, utilizing um, 
the force measured with the Sims Weinstein mono uh, filaments and how much force it took to uh, for the animal to withdraw. And again, confirmed that uh, diabetics in animals, diabetic animals that have the pressure taken off their nerves, react like normal animals and not like diabetics. So that's five separate basic science laboratories, which means that the initial observations are true. Uh, you know, I, I welcome that information because still today, I mean, it's nothing like in the early 2000s when when I got introduced to this from you, uh, there was a lot of pushback. There's still some pushback, but I think it's these types of studies that have been integral in getting, you know, people to to wake up a little bit. And uh, it's hard. You know, they they say that, um, you know, medicine's a really big boat. Big boats are slow to turn. And I think that's definitely true here. Now, one of my friends, um, actually, Alvin, you know, Alvin from the wine yes. group. Uh, Alvin was telling me the other day, which I thought was very insightful. He said, do you know what the, the slowest boat to turn is? And I said, no, I don't. He said, it's a partnership. <laughs> <laughs> because there's never a time when all the partners seem to agree. So I thought that was kind of a, you know, but uh, so, <laughs> yeah. So you made this observation, you then clinically at the same, oh, well, concurrently, let's say you're you're starting to integrate more and more lower extremity decompressions in these patients who basically asked you to do something with their lower extremities because they had success in their upper extremities. Right, right. One of the interesting things, which I know you're going to get to, um, for a long time, there's a big push to try to minimize the number of amputations in America. There were national programs which had interesting names like LEAP, Lower Extremity Amputation Prevention, and there were about 90,000 amputations a year, and there's still about 90,000 amputations um, a year. And three quarters of them, as you know, are due to nerve problems in the feet and diabetics. Only a quarter are due to circulation or um, blood vessel problems. And the um, world still has been very slow to accept this. And really, when a vascular surgeon gets a diabetic and he shows the holes are okay, he should tap on the ankle and see if they have a Tonell sign and then refer them to someone whom you and I have trained who can do this, the decompressions. So after the rat study, did Hopkins require you to do a little bit more in a mammalian model or am I just not... <laughs> Am I not remembering that correctly? <laughs> a mammalian model. So the, the mammalian model I chose were primates. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I had proven it to my own um, satisfied. I'd started with patients who got better. And then we sh showed the, the reason for it. And, and in the rat, it's not just that the <clears throat> nerve fills up with fluid. Um the ability of the nerve to transport a building block proteins is decreased. It's called slow axoplasmic transport. So the nerve in a tight area can't rebuild itself so well. And finally, the reason I mentioned trigger fingers, um, diabet people like guitar players, piano players, people that use their fingers a lot, you get inflammation that builds up on the tendon and the tendon gets stuck in the little tunnels and clicks. But a diabetics, and usually the people have one or two, diabetics have four or five trigger fingers at the same time. Hmm. And it's the mechanism that the sugar attaches to the collagen, which is the structural protein on the tunnels around the tendons. You can see the tendons on the back of your hand. And in the finger, there's a series of five of them. And because of those tunnels, we can make really tight um, grips. The joints all bend in. And when the sugar fills and thickens those tunnels, the, the tendons don't move well. Well, mm -hmm. uh, that can happen inside the nerve. Inside the nerve, between the nerve fibers, there's a structural protein collagen. And so the same glucose goes in and binds to collagen and makes the nerve stiffer. Um, and the way you measure that is what's called a stress strain curve. You pull something and it stretches and you keep pulling with more and more force until it finally stops stretching and then breaks. 
And, and finally, there have been two separate studies that show that in a diabetic um, animal, the diabetic nerve has an altered stress strain curve, meaning it's stiffer. So there are three underlying mechanisms in the diabetic related to their disease. And as surgeons, we don't change any of these things. They're still diabetics, but they don't have a tight place to press on the nerve. All of the sponsors of this podcast are listed on the website at podofinquiry.com. You can get great offers on these fantastic products and services, and this will help generate revenue for the show so that we can bring you the absolute best content. Thank you all for listening and supporting the show. This episode is sponsored by Savant Sellers, providers of boutique tier one reds at a tier two price point. Let's imagine you are spelunking in a cave out in Napa Valley and you come across some of the juice from Savant Cellars, you may just never want to come out until it's gone. Savant Cellars sources all of their fruit from the really big name boutique vineyards. That's right, where the elites get their fruit. If we put a vineyard designation on our bottles, we would be contractually forced to sell our wines at three to four times our current pricing. Yes, full disclosure, I am one of the three principals and I'm very proud of our wines. Savant Cellars, is the genius of wine. Simply great wines, vintage after vintage, crafted in a Bordeaux style so you can lay them down for years or drink them now. They simply just get better. Use the code SPELUNK15 to get a 15% discount at SavantCellars.com. That is C-E-V-A-N-T Cellars.com. SPELUNK15. I think that's... uh... I think that the the one thing that um you know it it's hard for people to understand this work is because the initial semantics were wrong when a lot of the people that you and I trained went out and they just indiscriminately said well we're operating on diabetic peripheral neuropathy and the answer is really you're operating on a superimposed nerve compression in a patient who has diabetic peripheral neuropathy I think that lack of judiciousness and in nomenclature might have led to some of the pushback that was seen in the neurology community uh yeah. and and when you lay it out like that it's very it's pretty straightforward no one can argue with that because the histology studies have been done you and uh dr mckinnon did you know um uh study back what in 84 i think it was where you uh, uh looked at the histology from a compression model um i believe that was a rat as well i'm not sure i know you did it in primates too uh yes so i i have to say as another compliment to you from someone who lived in texas a long time and now lives in the not the deep south but the south in atlanta you really speak well and and you're the way you say things can be easily understood (laughs) well i guess i appreciate that Uh, uh so well, let me but, comment on this other thing. Yeah. What, what, so the next, which I think is what you're asking me, after we showed it works in people, and after we showed that it would work in an animal model, uh, we then started following um, our patients because <clears throat> the question was, would getting feeling back in the foot mean that diabetics wouldn't have amputations anymore, that they wouldn't have ulcers anymore? And that's, in fact, what we found. We had a group of about uh, 40 patients who, um, and maybe it was 25 patients, who only came back, they never came back after I operated on one leg. And and one year we had um, two of our investigators uh, call this group of patients who never came back. And in the leg that we operated on, and of course you know that the blood sugar is the same in both your legs. Mm -hmm. And the leg we operated on had no amputations and no ulcerations. And the opposite leg that did not have the surgery, just like the rats that never had any surgery, they had um, two or three amputations and four or five patients had ulcers. And when you compare that statistically, there was a statistically significant difference in the leg that was operated on versus the non-operated leg, which is nothing to do with placebos. These are people who just didn't come back. They lived too far away. They thought I was done with them. For whatever reason, they never came back to do their other leg, even though one leg was better. 
And so that was the beginning of looking at whether or not this surgery can minimize overall health care costs by decreasing ulcers, amputations, and admission to the hospital for foot infections. So one of the areas of pushback, I think, is there's still this lack of understanding that a diabetic peripheral nerve, once a source of compression is removed, can regenerate, albeit axoplasmic flow is affected. There's more uh, advanced glycation end products in, in patients with diabetes. But I think Jacobson showed that, um, you know, in his stuff that he published, I think in the late 70s, that the and you showed this too with uh, one of the studies that's in your textbook uh, surgery of the peripheral nerve where you had the primate and you looked at the nerve at the um uh cubital tunnel compared a few inches north in an area where there's no known site of compression and the nerve looked like in the cubital tunnel looked like a little bomb had gone off the mm -hmm. myelin was gone it was just a bad looking nerve and then just north of it you had pretty pristine uh myelin you had some you know, intraneural edema, which you would expect, which is kind of like what Jacobson showed. But that refutes quite a bit there because that blood sugar isn't going to be different uh, two inches north than the cubital tunnels blood sugar, right? And then, and then comment on the fact that these nerves can regenerate, and you've shown that. So um, the first thing you said, we did do a separate study and showed that like a nerve repair in a diabetic animal um, will heal the same as it will in a non-diabetic animal. There, nerve regeneration in a diabetic can occur. It might be a little slower, but the same as it can. And there were many clinical studies that show patients with diabetes do as well after their carpal tunnel, maybe slightly less well than uh, non-diabetics. But um, the, the, the study you said in the monkey, that this is very important for another reason. One of the, you mentioned the word pushbacks. The, the neurologists... Um, well, this is what I say when I give my, if you become, um, if you're a Christian, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. And if you're a neurologist, you have to believe in electrodiagnostic testing. That's just the way it is. And so a neurologist doesn't believe there's a nerve compression unless they can show it with an electrodiagnostic study. And there's many, many things wrong with that assumption, but nevertheless, that's what guides their decision-making so in people that have all the symptoms of carpal tunnel and get sent for testing, one-third here, the electrical test says you're normal. One-half of people with clinical evidence of ulnar nerve problems at their elbow have normal electrical testing. In diabetics where the nerve is not normal with electrical testing, the nerve is usually so bad they can't show that there's an underlying, or as you said, superimposed nerve compression um, nevertheless, that's what they insist on. So what happened one day, um, and you mentioned we did research on monkeys, in the Hopkins uh, veterinary department, there was a, a cage with a monkey in it, and it's the cage was labeled Sweetie. Hmm. And an old Hopkins story um, hmm. is that in the 1890s, Dr. Osler, who was the first chief of medicine, would diagnose diabetes by sticking his finger into the person's urine, remembering urine is sterile, and taste it and say it was sweet. That was how they made the diagnosis of diabetes. So certainly at Hopkins, sweetie connotes a diabetic. And it turned out that this rhesus monkey was only the third spontaneous onset type <clears throat> 1, um, type 2 diabetes, insulin requiring diabetes in a rhesus monkey. And the veterinarians had written that and described it and written a paper about it. And so I asked one of the Hopkins neurologists, um, and to his credit, he came down and did the electrical testing. And he tested the upper extremity and the lower extremity. And he said, the monkey has diabetic neuropathy. It's exactly the same as humans. And then he said, well, it's an older monkey. It was like 20 years old. And he went out and found eight other old rhesus monkeys and tested them. And they came out with normal human type measurements for conduction velocity and latency. So we knew we had one monkey who electrically would be accepted by any neurologist as having neuropathy. And then, as you mentioned, we were able to take the median nerve at the wrist and above the wrist, the only nerve at the elbow and proximal. And um, at the all the pathology was where the nerve was in a tight place. Where the nerve was not in a tight place, 
it looked like a perfectly normal nerve. And so the answer is, is that multiple sites of compression along the course of a peripheral nerve can look like to an electrodiagnostic study, the person doing it as if they have an underlying diffuse neuropathy, and it's hard for them to pick up a nerve compression. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that if it was solely a metabolic problem without this compression, there would not be that uh, disparate uh, histology displayed under the microscope, which is very objective. Right. So the, what you said was exactly correct. This was another means we had of showing because in, in humans who have a nerve compression, we never take the nerve out because they would lose function. Right. So trouble showing in a human what the nerves with diabetes um, look like unless they, they look at the nerves in an amputated um, leg. And so this opportunity in this um, diabetic primate monkey was uh, very, very helpful in that regard. So the other compelling thing at, as far as the, the efficaciousness of this, this procedure uh, was something that I experienced personally, and I know you've talked about it, and that is the fact that so many people came back for their second leg to be done. And I think in ours, it was about 84%. We, we tracked people. I think it was like 2003, 2004 back in that. But I'd never seen something with a bilateral presentation where people would come back that high. I mean, 84, 85% of the time, they wanted that other leg done. And oftentimes it was very quick when they wanted, you know, that request was made. You know, first post-op visit, I can recall many, many patients saying, you know, when can we do the next one? And that's pretty compelling from a, yes, it's anecdotal. It's a series of, you know, a bunch of series of N of ones, but that was powerful enough that, when I first started doing these procedures, I got a little bit of pushback, but I was pretty well liked by by our little hospital surgery center. And they said, well, you've been doing some you know, good work here. We, we'll, we'll kind of let you go ahead and get started with this. And then at about six months, uh, the chief uh, anesthesiologist came in and he said, listen, he goes, I've noticed that almost all these folks have come back for their other leg. He said, I find that incredibly compelling. To me, that's that's the ultimate level one study. And I thought that was really a powerful thing. Yeah, because um, patients don't like having surgery. They don't no. want to have surgery. So unless something really, really worked, you know, and, and for example, I've noticed, I've had people that have had one hip replaced and they're so comfortable, they look forward to having their other hip replaced, even though that's a huge operation compared to the things we're doing for the nerves. So if a patient comes back and wants it done to the other side, um, they have no reason to want to do that unless it really made them better. Yeah, no, it's it's fascinating. So really, it comes back to what I wanted to start out with, and, and that's this observation you made. And, you know, I, I, I'm sure there was a lot of people that were doing very similar work to you that never made that observation. What Was there something that kind of just triggered your thought process? But, like, I've got to follow this up. This This is anathema to me uh, and what I was taught. These people shouldn't be getting sensation back. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm just going to say something about my book again. Um, the book ends with this operation being done on someone who has a neuropathy. And I'll leave it to the reader to see how the uh, book concludes. But <clears throat> the book is set in 1910. And I... It's historic fiction. Everything in it is true, except I made up the characters. But the characters live through the events that I've lived through in my life and the way I've been attacked for the new new operations I've introduced. And I think the reader will have um, fun seeing what happens. And remember, the lead character in my story is a woman. There were very few, if any, uh, women surgeons in 1910. So the book has the controversies related to women and surgery, surgeons versus orthopedic surgeons and what they do to nerves, uh, lawyers and how they react to new operations um, and how people in general react to introducing something like this work with, uh, with diabetes. Uh, but what, what happened was once I was convinced that this really was true and it worked, 
we began to have these workshops where you were very helpful. We had 30 workshops between uh, the year 2000 and 2008. We trained 353 people, the majority of which were um, podiatrists, many of whom had learned the endoscopic plantar fasciotomy from yourself. And, and in that group, we tried to always include surgical educators, program directors, neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, plastic surgeons, besides the podiatric foot and ankle surgeons. So these ideas would spread out uh, throughout the country. And we have a lot more education to do, but I mentioned China. There are several really large studies with 500 patients now from China, mm -hmm. which is, of course, one of the oldest countries in the world. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you know this, Steve, but the newest country in the world, which is called uh, North Macedonia, um, the chief of plastic surgery is a woman, and uh, she's doing this surgery there. And at our Peripheral Nerve Society meeting, which is now three weeks ago, she had a group of patients that had uh, wound healing diabetics with ulcers who had wound healing problems that she released the nerve and um, identified quicker wound healing. And um, her husband is a cardiologist in his laboratory could measure blood flow. And she measured blood flow in the feet in these people and showed improved blood flow mm -hmm. in the diabetic she's been operating on. So the word is spreading slowly to the oldest country, one of the oldest countries, and to the newest country. Uh, little by little, we hope to change um, this backlog of uh, people not understanding what's going on. Well, I think even the most critical critic, once they look at some of this uh, very objective science, um, like you said, it's hard to attribute an ulceration to a placebo effect or lack of an ulceration to a placebo effect. So you combine the, you know, the clinical data with what's already been done, you know, what you were the, the genesis of the rat studies, the primate study. I, I think if people really are forced to sit down at the table and look at all of this, not to mention the fact that there's a whole, you know, cadre of patients saying, yeah, I had my second leg done. It, it's pretty hard for, I would think, somebody to just remain still uh, entrenched in that that old paradigm when they, they really start to look at this. I mean, we've got even studies now showing improvements in intraoperative nerve monitoring within minutes after the nerve is being uh, decompressed. Certainly, there's no way that a placebo effect could be attributed to that. I mean, that current is either going through the pipe or it's not going through the pipe, you know. Yeah. And the answer to that is improved blood flow, which I just said um, yeah, uh, happens. And the, the neurologists, um, so just to step back a little bit, when, when I would introduce this, me in a hospital operating, I would bring uh, the family back or the anesthesiologist back and i would uh, tickle the bottom of the patient's foot and whereas prior to that they couldn't really feel their foot they would often laugh because they suddenly had this feeling in the bottom of their foot the neurologist criticized me a lot for this but what their thought was is the nerve fibers have died and they couldn't have regenerated from their ankle to their toe in the hour in the recovery room and that's correct Right. And the reason it happens is because, um, and as you've seen in the common perineal nerve, where the nerve has, has sort of a narrow band, you can see blood vessels right up to the narrow band, then no blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And you decompress the nerve and you see blood flow immediately right back into the nerve. And so the nerve fibers, when you sleep on your hand and you wake up because your hand is numb, the nerve didn't die. The pressure just stopped the blood flow. Mm -hmm. So the buzzing and tingling is a result of decreased blood flow. And for the nerve fibers that haven't died, but just stop reporting messages to the brain because of the pressure, when you relieve that pressure, they can wake up in the operating room or show improved motor function in the operating room when you're testing on them. I mean, when they wake up in the recovery room, and they can suddenly have improved sensation. Those are fibers that haven't truly died. The ones, the fibers died, they grow back an, an inch a year, and it may take a year for the patient to really get feeling back in their big toe if they're advanced and if they already have ulcers in their foot. You mean an inch a month? Yes. Yeah. What did I say? You said an inch a year, but I knew what you meant. <laughs> I bet, I, I've been a good student. Um, it's 12 then, inches usually from your ankle, the tarsal tunnel to your big toe, more or less. And so it, it can take up to a year. Right. Around, 
The pain is often relieved as soon as the pressure is off the nerve, but sensory recovery can take much longer. Well, a couple of comments I want to follow that up because not only did we see very similar findings intraoperatively with blood flow, we did some uh, laser Doppler flowmetry studies and uh, we saw, I mean, in fact, it was such an incredible um, improvement that the gentleman, unfortunately, he's passed away now, but who was doing the vascular studies up at one of the, the wound care centers that we worked with, uh, called me up one day and he said, I'm seeing really crazy stuff in your patients that have had this decompression. We're seeing like 3,000% increases in response to thermal stimulus. We're seeing, you know, uh, significant blood flow improvement. And, and so we saw that. Now, interestingly, you know, and I think that explains a lot that where you have a focal compression, you have focal ischemia. I mean, I have intraoperative photos that that show that. I mean, uh, and but we've also seen that with some of our diagnostic blocks. I've talked to you about the the Phoenix sign, the the discovery that was made back in 2017, which is is really phenomenal because what we're able to see after that is uh, with our Doppler ultrasound, we're able to look and, and see waveforms of arteries. And in many of these patients, they had no dorsalis pedis artery. But then four minutes after this block, because of the vasodilatation, they then showed a, a, an artery was, that was not there previously. So you're, you're seeing improvements in vasculature uh, that just by getting the compression off, you'll see that vasonevorum fill up. So that that explains why we're seeing the intraoperative nerve monitoring results. But like you say, the neurologists just assume everything is dead and it's not. It's just not getting its fair drink of water. Right. So, That's right. It's a good uh, way to it's a good way to explain that. I actually didn't answer one of the things you said before. After I, I did the work on hands and began to do the work in feet. It, it brought to mind the work of a, a doctor named Paul Brandt, who worked with leprosy patients. And his father and mother were Christian missionaries. And he was born in India in a, in a city called Belur, which is north of uh, Chennai. Um, and he grew up as a child seeing children with leprosy where the bone was sticking out of the bottom of their foot and their foot was off to the side. And his parents would never let him play with these children. Then he was sent back to London, where they were from, and went through medical school, became an orthopedic surgeon. And then after World War II, he, they all survived the bombings in London. He went back to India, and he lived with the leprosy patients, and they lived in the house with him. And he began to see these patterns in their hand for the older nerve and foot drop, and he realized these were peripheral nerve problems. Hmm. And his book that he wrote, <clears throat> which he called Pain, the gift that nobody wants, I wouldn't sell. And he took pain out of the title, and then the book would sell. And his point was that if you have pain, it's protective. And without pain, you, you're anesthetic. And the, the real reason that the diabetic, that the leprosy patients lose their fingers, their toes, their nose, is they were cast out to live in uh, alone in valleys and impoverished places. And the animals at night, the little rats, would come and eat off their fingers and uh, toes. And the Indians were Hindus and would not allow um, dissections. <clears throat> so his book is an adventure story, which reminds me of what I was going through with, with the diabetics. And one night, um, a Hindu uh, person died in the jungle, didn't have any family. And Dr. Brandt was, per, was allowed to uh, do an autopsy on this person. And he found that the peripheral nerves, because that was his clue, they looked like normal nerves till they got to tight places where they had big swollen areas in front of each tight place, which was what was causing the nerve. He didn't know then about the bacteria, but that was his idea that nerves would become involved right near an area of compression. And he wrote his book to help educate people about um, leprosy and why they had their deformities and their progressive paralysis. And, and my book, The Pro Sector, was written really to educate people about peripheral nerves and about peripheral nerve research. Uh, and it takes you on a journey through different uh, pain problems, going from burning pain in the back of the hand to groin pain from hernias, the problems in the leg after fractures, and finally ending with the work with uh, diabetics. 
And so that was the next part in the evolution, which is what you um, had asked me besides following my patients was to begin to work on a way to educate the public about this problem. Mm -hmm. We hope you all enjoyed today's show and got some truly empowering knowledge out of it. You can always follow up on anything we talked about in the show notes found at our website, potofinquiry.com. If this incredible and educational conversation has tickled just a little bit of your cortex, please leave us a review and spread the message to your friends and colleagues. Let's keep spelunking. This podcast is designed for informational purposes only. It does not constitute any medical or surgical consulting advice or imply a development of any physician-patient relationship. The opinions of guests who are featured on the show are not necessarily the opinions of Dr. Barrett or the production team. This podcast is owned solely by Barrett Medical and Surgical Media, LLC. While the show is highly oriented for physicians and healthcare providers, anyone interested in the improvement of human performance and understanding will find us a welcome goblet to sip from or guzzle. However, no representation or warranties are made in any way whatsoever on this podcast for any products, techniques, or other things discussed. Invited guests are not vetted by the pod of inquiry for their qualifications and may have a direct or indirect financial interest in what they present and discuss on the show. The pod of inquiry disclaims any responsibility from anything taken from the show and used personally or professionally. It is a responsibility of the listener to perform their own due diligence prior to the implementation of any ideas, products, techniques, or anything talked about on the show.